Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. They now have live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service. At IHM VCU, we've always been here for you. You are and always will be our top priority. We care about your financial and physical health, and we are here. IHM VCU is a proud supporter of WQPT. A challenge to Iowa. Do the Iowa caucuses have any national support left? And creating a mix of exercise for the body and the mind, a very different library in the cities. The one thing we've learned is that there's very little time between the moment one presidential election ends and another begins. There are already Republicans cautiously testing the waters of Iowa, preparing for a race that won't include Donald Trump, but not angering the former president if he does indeed decide to run. But that's just one of the issues about the 2024 nominating process that needs to sort itself out. The other involves the Iowa caucuses, the race to be first, and the power play that's going on right now. That's why we talked with the new Iowa Democratic Party chair, State Representative Ross Wilburn. You've heard what Nevada is doing. You know that New Hampshire is going to fight against it. What say Iowa? I say that uh, the move by other states to try uh, to move ahead in the calendar is, is nothing new. It happens every four years when the calendar comes out. And we're used to states trying to jump ahead of us. And uh, we're having important conversations with the DNC. My team's working hard to make sure Iowans continue to have a voice during this important process. Let's be honest. It's a huge black eye that 2020 was, 2020 was for Iowa. Is, is that insurmountable? No, absolutely not. I mean, we, we acknowledge problems in the initial reporting of numbers, but, you know, many, if not most of the actual caucus process itself went smoothly around the state. In fact, I remember during my caucus, uh, people were, were pretty excited uh, and uh, there was a, a couple of folks from the deaf community who were excited. I was trying my rudimentary uh, sign language skills to communicate with them, but we're always working to improve the caucus process and we're working in partnership with other state leaders and the DNC, because we're going to continue to work to increase, uh, uh, you know, the the, uh, uh, the caucus process. So, but the caucus really is a providing a huge bump. I mean, if these presidential candidates are going to spend this much time, effort, and money into Iowa, they want something from it, and that's that huge bump they get, and they got nothing like that in 2020. I'm, I'm going to push back on that because they get uh, they get so much more out of it. Uh, Iowa, uh, you know, there's no better advertisers than than Iowa. They they uh, they love to uh, work on campaigns. In fact, Iowans, once they move on, uh, do phone calls, uh, letter writing. In fact, myself, uh, back during the Obama uh, one uh, administration, well, b before he ran, uh, I traveled to um, uh, Washington, D.C. for uh, the uh, the caucus, uh, or the uh, the uh, primary season out there to, to vote. So Iowans are very, very active. And the candidates get a good cross section of the country when they come to Iowa. Well, that, that's what Iowans say, but you know so well that if you don't live in Iowa, that's not what they're thinking. They're thinking that this is a predominantly white, a predominantly uh, a rural area that doesn't represent the nation. You're, you're talking and looking at an African-American who is the chairperson of the Iowa Democratic Party. It, it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, the narrative that there's no diversity in Iowa has, has come forward because we have uh, a deep, uh, rich tradition in terms of civil rights accomplishments and leaders coming forward. Uh, we're a good cross-section of uh, not only rural working-class Iowans, but we've got uh, many of our, our BIPOC community here. Uh, so it's a great chance for for candidates, especially if they don't have a lot of name recognition or if they don't uh, have a lot of money to come here to test out their messages, to hear uh, from Iowans that represent a cross section of the country. One of the greatest things that happened to the Iowa caucus, of course, and you were involved in it, was the election of Barack Obama, only because Iowa put Barack Obama on the map and made him a legitimate candidate. Not so much, of course, for the Clintons and not so much for Joe Biden. So is the fact that it's a Joe Biden White House have an impact on Iowa caucuses? In other words, is he as friendly towards Iowa as you would hope he would be? You also have to look at what happened um, beyond Iowa. Once they got to South Carolina, uh, 
the uh, then vice president Biden had to uh, had to step forward to connect with uh, the African American community, and he did so, and, and he won, and now he's delivering. He and 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 Vice President Harris are uh, delivering for not only Iowans but the American people. But it's a good point that if you notice, the, some of the people that are some of his closest confidants are are Harry Reid and Jim Clyburn, Harry Reid, of course, from Nevada, Jim Clyburn from South Carolina, and neither one of them really believe that Iowa should be first in the nation. Again, I just go back to uh, every four years when the, when the calendar comes up that uh, different states buy, buy for different uh, position, and uh, uh, Iowa is part of that, uh, that four-state cutout. Uh, we want to be part of the conversation. It's important that, uh, uh, you know, if, if if we can do it here in Iowa in terms of uh, working class, in terms of uh, that rural voice, in terms of our communities of color, our LGBTQ plus uh, communities uh, with living people living with disability, if, if we can do it and support and lift uh, our diverse communities here in Iowa, we can do it across the country. Is Iowa turning Republican more than Democrat? It seems to be more red than purple. Yeah, you know, um, I, I think Iowans agree with Democrats on, on many of the most important issues. Uh, I, you mentioned I'm in the legislature. Uh, Iowans talk about strong public education, uh, affordable prescription drugs, background checks for gun pur purchases, uh, more economic opportunity for all of us. So uh, we just have to make sure that as we get back out to organizing, which we've already started to do, uh, we, you know, we had unfortunately we weren't able to do it to, or do it consistently during uh, the initial part of the pandemic. Uh, we want to make sure that we are we are reconnecting and connecting with Iowans so that they can they can know that I uh, Democrats are not only uh, saying that we're on their side, but we're at their side on on these issues. But two years ago, Democrats thought that they were going to get better control of the state legislature, and instead Republicans held on, if not gained. Is it that the Democratic message isn't working or you didn't have good candidates? Nationwide, there is an issue with uh, uh, rural and working class folks not necessarily feeling the connection that they had uh, with Democrats uh, in previous years. And there, there's no question that the, the pandemic like had an effect on us here. But, uh, you know, if you take a look at the recent voter registration numbers from the Iowa Secretary of State's office just released today, uh, in three of our four congressional districts, registered Democrat voters outnumbered registered Republicans. Uh, that includes the first and second congressional districts, which are currently represented by Republicans. So overall, Republicans do have uh, 23,000 more registered voters than us, but our Democratic activists are closing the gap and they are out working now because, uh, especially with the voter suppression bill that was pushed through by the radical Republican legislature and governor. Uh, so we're, uh, we're getting ready to go. I was going to ask you about that, so we might as well go to it next, and that is changes as far as voting is concerned in Iowa. Is it pretty much set in stone, or do Iowa Democrats plan to challenge what the state legislature and the governor has already approved? Uh, we're fortunate one of the great partners, uh, not only in Iowa but across the uh, country, are challenging election laws. Uh, LULAC has uh, been an important uh, uh, voice and, and uh and uh, activists across the country and here in Iowa. And so they are taking that to court. Uh, in the meantime, Iowans are already, uh, Democrats are already working to try and let uh, uh, people know they need to check their voter status. The, the new G GOP law requires the Secretary of State uh, to move all voters who didn't cast ballots in the most recent general election, one election, to inactive. And previously, uh, they had to miss two uh, consecutive general elections. So uh, uh, Iowans uh, of, of uh, Republicans, uh, no party, uh, other parties are very upset about uh, the damage that uh, uh, the Republican Party in Iowa and governor have done to make it harder to vote. They'd rather rig the system in, in their favor than than uh, you know, be held accountable for the problems they're causing. Whether that's true or not, as you know, the U.S. Supreme Court has just ruled in favor of uh, the changes that are going on in Arizona, which uh, kind of puts a setback to some of these challenges, don't you think? Uh, you know, time is going to tell on that. There will be other uh, there will be other challenges. That's that's one ruling. We'll see how that uh, we'll see how that plays itself out. But we're not sitting and waiting uh, on on litigation. Uh, we are, our activists are working to get people to check their voter status. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can to uh, fire people up and make sure that w Democrats want you to be able to express your voice and your voice is your vote. 
For Iowa Democrats, are the biggest races the race for Iowa governor and uh, the U.S. Senate, uh, uh, depending upon what Charles Grassley does? You know, we are working, uh, I have two parts to that question. We're, we're working to challenge every race that we can. And uh, I'm focused and we're focused on growing our party, on getting out the message and connecting with Iowa Democrats, uh, no party and moderate Republicans across the state. I've been traveling across the state. Uh, earlier this month, I was in Fort Dodge and Davenport. Uh, I was in Grimes in early June in Red Oak. So west, south, uh, north, east, we are we are working to uh, uh, to connect with Iowans and to get people ready to uh, pay attention to uh, not only the damage that Republicans have done, uh, but what Iowans are doing, starting with what Democrats are doing in Iowa, as well as in Washington, D.C., with, uh, uh, you know, every every uh, uh, thing the, the Biden administration has done, getting vaccines in people's uh, arms, as well as the uh, financial support uh, that they are they are getting and hopefully the upcoming infrastructure bill. But once again, is it the governor's race and the U.S. Senate race that that really topped the chart, so to speak, for for state Democrats? Uh, Democrats are focused on challenging every every race we can. Let's talk about what we're seeing in the Republican Party right now. I'm, I'm sure that it's nice for you to be an outsider looking in. And we're seeing some candidates who are putting their toe in the water in Iowa, still unclear of what Donald Trump is going to do. Um, is that surprising to you that people such as Tom Cotton, uh, Tim Scott are, are, are sniffing around Iowa, so to speak? Not at all. And, and uh, you know, while Democrats and Republicans may not agree on much, uh, here in Iowa, we're both agreed on uh, going back to the caucus and first in the nation caucus. Uh, that's one area we are in support. And so, uh, you know, I've been in communications with the Iowa uh, Republican chair and, uh, uh, you know, they are proceeding with uh, Iowa being the first uh, caucus in the nation. So uh, the Republican Party, they, they've got uh, uh, they have. Um, they have some explaining to do not only to the American people but within their their party. Uh, they've got a a, a radical right uh, agenda that is upsetting Iowans uh, across the board, and so uh, it's not surprising that they are coming here. And it it, it just adds credence to what I said about uh, it's an opportunity for those who don't have as much name recognition, who don't have a lot of money, that they can connect uh, and test their message here, uh, but also potentially have. Iowans helping them out in other parts of the country. Once again, a perceived notion and somewhat a fact too is that Democrats do very well in urban areas and not rural areas. And you see that time and time again in elections in Iowa where the pockets of Democratic strength appear to be the cities. What are you gonna do to reach out to rural areas uh, to make more Democratic gains in those areas? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are, uh, as Democrats, we are working, it's not, an, it's not a new idea, it's just we're coming back to it, especially out of the pandemic, that we are uh, trying to organize as a state party uh, year round. So we're trying to expand to that year round organizing uh, and trying to, we're already getting training programs for our activists and candidates uh, to grow our democratic grassroots network around the state. Uh, it's building those long-term relationships with volunteers, activists, and voters in every corner of the state. That's what helps build strong campaigns and it helps our candidates connect to people in their communities. But why don't you think the democratic message is taking root in, in, in rural areas? Uh, you know, that's, that's been a challenge across the country uh, not just here in Iowa. And, and look, uh, you know, we obviously need to do a, a, a better job. We're going to improve connecting, uh, reconnecting again with the, with the pandemic. We want to make sure that, um, that uh, folks know that uh, it's Democrats that are, are de delivering that stimulus that, that's come out. Uh, Democrat uh, Joe Biden delivered that. And so uh, we are going to uh, continue to uh, reach out. We've got Democrats out in those areas. Uh, we're going to start turning those red areas pink to start winning uh, elections statewide and in local communities. Iowa Democratic Party Chair, State Representative Ross Wilburn. The fireworks of the 4th of July may be over, but there's still plenty of summer left, of course, and it's especially true for all the events in our area that had to be canceled last year. They are just trying to make the most of this year. Laura Adams knows your best bets if you plan to go out and about. This is Out and About for July 9th through 19th. 
The John Deere Classic is underway at TPC Deer Run through the 11th, or come join the Walcott Truckers Jamboree the 8th through 10th. Outdoor concerts include Lincoln Park in Rock Island Starlight Review concerts on Tuesdays at 7, Fridays head down to Mercado on 5th and Moline starting at 5, Thursday nights enjoy music at Bass Street Landing at 7, or bring the kids for music and fun with Babalu at the Lincoln Park Band Shell the 15th at 10.30 a.m. Shake the Floor Dance Competition hosted by the Pink Dynamic Dolls takes place at the River Center July 10th, while the Mercer County Fair runs July 13th through 17th. The Jamborella Country Fest Assisting River Music Experience takes place at Mississippi Valley Fairgrounds the 10th and 11th. Plus, enjoy the City of Eldridge, Iowa's sesquicentennial event featuring the Moonlight Chase. On stage, Genesius Guild presents Shakespeare's Life in His Works by Shakespeare and Don Wooten the 10th and 11th at 7 in Lincoln Park. The Mississippi Bend Players present No Child at Augustana's Bruner Theater July 8th through 11th. And ABBA's hits ring out at Quad City Music Guild's production of Mamma Mia opening July 9th, while Saturday Night Fever opens at Circa 21 July 14th. Plus, the Black Box Theater present the Midwest premiere of I and You by Laura Gunderson beginning the 15th. For more information, visit WQPT.org. Thank you, Laura. Jenny Lynn Stacy is like a lot of performers these days, just getting back to performing in front of a live audiences. She says it feels good to be in front of the folks again. She did perform some of her own original works on the stage of the Black Box Theater Moline before the pandemic broke out. So here's Jenny Lynn Stacy with I Prefer It. prefer it this way This way. Jenny Lynn Stacy at the Black Box Theater in Moline with I Prefer It. When is a library not a library? And when is a gymnasium not a gym? The Two Rivers YMCA and the Rock Island Library plans to transform the old Tri-City Jewish Center into a new library and why? Bring together the opportunity to exercise both the body and the gray cells while also becoming a neighborhood linchpin. The wise Annika Martin joined us to talk about that and the ongoing fundraising campaign, plus the unique idea behind this very different facility. Where did the idea come from to bring two big different concepts? If you think about it, the YMCA, which is thought of more as, as physical fitness, and the library, which is more, let's say, mental fitness, for lack of a better term. 
You know, it really ended up being kind of one of those perfect place, perfect time kind of things. Uh, the library was looking for a space to continue serving the community near the old 3031 branch. And the Y's always had a program office in Rock Island for the last several years. And we provide school age care programming and the food program in collaborations with the Rock Island schools. But uh, we wanted to be able to serve even more in Rock Island. And the former Tri-City Jewish Center was becoming available. Uh, it is a wonderful and unique space, but it, it was it was far too large for either of our organizations to use alone. So sharing the space just seems to be a natural fit and we're really excited about it. Has this done been done before? Because it seems like a great idea is to combine the two, as you said, uh, uh, make the most of both of your strengths in a building that was too big for either one of you individually. Right, we're not the first in, first Hawaiian library in the country to collaborate like this. Uh, we're certainly the first in this area, but we're really excited about the partnership and what it can bring to Rock Island. Yeah, because let's be honest, and I don't mean this in a mean way, but the Two Rivers YMCA has got a great name, but it's always been thought of as the Moline YMCA. So this is really important for you guys to expand into Rock Island in this way. Right. I, I mean, like I said, we have a wonderful collaboration with the Rock Island Milan School District. And, uh, you know, we have been serving uh, that that community for quite a while. Um, this will just give us a bigger footprint in the city. Well, and as you pointed out, it's near 3030. So is that a good neighborhood? Is that is that an interesting place for you to expand? It is, you know, it is walkable from six area schools, which is really important for the people in the neighborhood to have something that's really accessible. Uh, and so the location is perfect. You don't think, now mind you, this is the old uh, Tri-Cities Jewish Center. You don't think of that as a place that you can build a gym and, 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 and things along that line, but you're really adapting this building as best you can. We are, you know, it's a great building. It has great bones and there are already some wonderful spaces for our needs. There is a gymnasium in the building already and a very large kitchen, uh, but we do plan to do a major renovation that will outfit the building and make it more efficient for both the library and the Y needs. And that explains the capital campaign that has just kicked off. Explain that to me. Well, our goal is to raise $7.8 million. Uh, we've been working really hard on this uh, and we just have so much gratitude for all of our donors so far. Uh, already to this point, we've raised over 7 million and that's come from about 180 donors, foundations, organizations, families, individuals. Um, it's been really amazing to see the support from the community. Uh, we've already surpassed the 90% mark, but we still have some work to do. So right now we're in the community phase of the campaign, which is really exciting because this is when we've made our project public and we're sharing the good news with the entire community. And it's really the support and the buy-in from the community that's gonna put us over the top. That's what I was wondering in particular, because yeah, you can get the corporate donations and you can get the philanthropists that are taking part in this. How important is it to get this community backing? And we're talking about, I mean, you're talking about 7.8 million. You've already got more than seven. So 800,000 isn't an insurmountable amount. It's not, and it's really uh, getting that support from the entire community and the people that are going to be using the facility um, that's that's really going to help us reach, you know, that final stretch. And uh, it really helps people feel more involved, too. We're really excited. We talk about the library and we know what the library offers. And actually, it's even more than than that. It's not just books and reading materials and audio equipment. It, it, it's also uh, community event rooms and things like that. But I think the people may not understand the YMCA is more than just a physical fitness facility is that you're also offering programs for young people and people in crisis. That's very true. You know, it it is the first thing you think of with this project is working out and books. And you're right, there's so much more to it than that. Uh, the Y will have a wellness area like you would expect, but we're also going to have areas for youth programming, uh, classroom areas for chronic disease programming like Livestrong for uh, cancer survivors and body in motion uh, for people with Parkinson's and so much more. Uh, there's a child watch area, which is a safe place for children to be while parents are using the facility and the kitchen. And there is an amazing kitchen in this facility. Uh, the Y has run the Nourish program for a few years now. In 2019, we actually served over 210,000 meals to children in the community at 35 sites across Rock Island County. And to do that, we've been using three different kitchens. Our kitchen here at the Y, the kitchen at the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Center and the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, but with this state-of-the-art big kitchen that's already in that facility, we can centralize
revitalize operations, expand our capacity, and in the first year of operating in that location, we're anticipating serving over 300,000 meals. It really is kind of a new step forward for the YMCA, the Two Rivers YMCA. It's really moving you even further into the new century. It is. We can't wait. <laughs> Absolutely. So tell me one more thing in regards to the, the building. You were talking about that's going to involve renovations, major renovations. How long is it going to take? When do you hope to open? Well, we don't have a complete solid date on it yet. Uh, we're hoping for, you know, next summer in 2020 uh, or 2022. I'm sorry. Uh, but we already have our construction company and architecture and engineering firms lined up. Everybody's ready to get to work as soon as we can close this campaign. And once again, when we're talking about the campaign, how can people help out? How can people donate? Oh, they, we have a joint website. Uh, it is RI, like Rock Island, ymcalibrary.org. There's so much information on there. Uh, you can find out anything you need to know about the, the campaign and the new facility, as well as give a gift if and, you are so inclined. And the campaign kicked off just mere days ago. Have you noticed any bump since then? Yes, this community phase that kicked off, we've definitely been seeing some action. Uh, we had a wonderful event the other uh, earlier this week, and it's it's been wonderful, and we're just so appreciative of the community support. Annika Martin with the Two Rivers YMCA. To learn more about the plans for the new Rock Island facility, check out the details at the Two Rivers YMCA website. On the air, on the radio, on the web, on your mobile device, and streaming on your computer. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. They now have live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service. At IHM VCU, we've always been here for you. You are and always will be our top priority. We care about your financial and physical health, and we are here. IHM VCU is a proud supporter of WQPT.